And thank you for joining the GenTech Alliance for this webinar titled Sexual Dimorphism in Thoracic Aortic Disease. For this webinar, we will use the Q&A functionality built into Zoom to field any questions you may have for today's speakers. Please click on the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen to submit your questions, and we'll get to as many of those as we can at the end of the session. I'm going to take a minute to introduce our first speaker before I turn the floor over to him. Scott A. Lemaire is a professor of cardiac and thoracic surgery in the Heart and Vascular and Research Institutes at Geisinger. He serves as the Associate Chief Scientific Officer at Geisinger and the Associate Dean for Research at the Geisinger Commonwealth School of Medicine. Prior to his transition to Geisinger in 2023, he served as the inaugural Jimmy and Roberta Howell Professor of Cardiovascular Surgery, the Vice Chair of Research in the Michael E. DeBakey Department of Surgery, the Director of Research in the Division of Cardiothoracic Surgery, and Professor of Surgery and of Integrative Physiology at Baylor College of Medicine, as well as a member of the academic professional staff of the Texas Heart Institute in Houston. His primary area of interest is thoracic aortic disease, with a particular emphasis on organ protection during aortic surgery, genetic aspects of thoracic aortic disease, and molecular mechanisms of aortic wall degeneration. Let me stop screen sharing. And Dr. Lemaire, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lauren. Let me just pull up the slide here. Is that coming across okay? Yes, looks perfect. Great. Um, welcome, everyone. And uh, it's really my pleasure to uh, be able to kick this session off. And I, I really appreciate the uh, invitation to participate in this um, in, in this uh, panel presentation related to sex-based differences in thoracic aortic disease. Now, in 10 minutes, we're, we're only going to be able to scratch the surface on the uh, many differences that exist in um, thoracic aortic aneurysms and dissections in uh, men and women. Um, the key areas I'm going to touch on are epidemiology and clinical presentation, differences in aortic wall biology, and differences in outcome after surgical treatment. Um, but before, but since we're only going to scratch the surface, for those of you who are interested in diving deeper into each of these, um, I wanted to provide a few key references that were extremely helpful in putting together this presentation. Um, first of all, there are two uh, terrific reviews, um, uh, one by uh, Jennifer Chung and colleagues, and uh, one uh, in uh, Jack by um, Daniela Cruselet and colleagues on sex differences in thoracic aortic disease, I highly recommend. And then I particularly want to um, acknowledge this uh, great special issue that uh, Dr. Rana Afifi has put together on aortic disease in women. Um, and there are many uh, articles in this special issue focused on um, differences in surgical outcomes, as well as some uh, fundamental issues related to treating um, uh, the, the uh, incidence of aortic aneurysm and dissection that occurred, occurred during pregnancy. Uh, so to start with epidemiology and clinical presentation, uh, it's well established that in general, thoracic aortic aneurysms and dissections occur more commonly in males with about a 70 to 30 ratio, um, and that males have uh, developed disease at younger ages. But despite the increased uh, prevalence of the disease in males, the severity of thoracic aortic aneurysms and dissections is higher in females. They tend to have more rapid aneurysm expansion. They have higher rates of dissection, rupture, and aortic deaths. And they uh, tend to have unfavorable hemodynamic factors, such as higher rates of um, uh, hypertension. Just move this. So um, when we look at um, uh, thoracic aortic aneurysms and dissections, females present later in, in the progression of their disease and tend to uh, present with larger aneurysms, particularly if you index aortic size to body size. They tend to be referred later for treatment 
and they undergo surgical repair less frequently. And it does call to question the, the uh, potential for them being disadvantaged because uh, diameter thresholds are are often expressed as uh, sort of a one size fits all and not are not uh, uh, altered based specifically on uh, the patient's sex. And so this is this is uh, for example, from the most recent, uh, American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association guidelines. And uh, you can see that uh, in Marfan syndrome, uh, for the ascending aorta, the aorta root, there are uh, guidelines that are focused on indexing to, to uh, patient body size. And that does uh, help alleviate some of the, the issue. But for, for aneurysms, any other area of the aorta, there is a five centimeter threshold uh, for asymptomatic patients, regardless of sex. And so given that women have um, uh, smaller diameters in the, in the normal condition, um, it means that by the time they would hit that five centimeter threshold, they actually have more advanced disease than their male counterparts. If we look at acute aortic dissection, uh, the best information comes out of the International Registry for Acute Aortic Dissection in two seminal uh, studies, uh, one by um, Christina Neighbor and one by Harris and colleagues, have shown that female develop, females develop dissection at an older age. They're more likely to have atypical symptoms. Uh, they, for example, they are less frequently have abrupt onset of pain they less uh, likely have pulse deficits, which are key hallmarks of the disease. They tended to have delayed presentations and delays in diagnosis, and were more likely to present with coma, shock, tamponade, or heart failure. And similarly, they were less likely to undergo surgical repair. So just sh shifting briefly to aortic wall biology, I'm not going to say a lot about this because um, Drs. Cassis and Sips are going to be covering them in much more detail during their presentations, but a few general comments. Um, first of all, in women, there is a recognized protective effect on the aortic wall of estrogen, including a reduction in wall inflammation um, that may offer protection that could be lost then during menopause. In the setting of aortic aneurysms, um, uh, aortic walls from females exhibited elevated levels of proteases, uh, here noted as MMP2 and MMP9. These destroy the components of the extracellular matrix um, and um, uh, reduced levels of the inhibitors of those proteases. Um, so we'll hear, and, and that can lead to uh, increased rates of aortic wall degeneration and less stability of the aortic wall, which may be um, uh, risk factors for dissection and rupture. So we'll hear more about those uh, briefly. Uh, I really want to focus a little time on differences in outcomes after surgical treatment. When you look at acute aortic dissection, on the left shows um, type A or ascending dissection repair, and it's notable that women have a much higher risk of in-hospital mortality at 32% compared to 22% in males. At least in the era of open descending repair, type B repairs had um, uh, similar rates of mortality between uh, males and females. When you looked at ascending aortic aneurysm repair in the elective setting, Females were noted in this uh, Netherlands heart registration study to be older, to have more often have pulmonary disease, particularly COPD and heart failure, and underwent less common, uh, less complex operations. In particular, fewer concomitant root repairs and fewer concomitant arch repairs. They more often developed pulmonary failure after surgery. They had longer hospital stays and higher rates of in-hospital mortality, uh, nearly double that of their male counterparts. Looking at aortic arch repair, this is a terrific study uh, from the Canadian Thoracic Aortic Collaborative in over 1,600 patients. And they found in patients undergoing aortic arch repair, females, again, were older at the time of their surgery, had larger aneurysms when indexed to body size, also underwent less complex operations, 
but despite having uh, um, a less complex operations, they had worse outcomes. And some of those outcomes are shown on the right. Women had a 31% incidence of adverse events compared to 27% for men. Uh, women had 11% mortality compared to 7% for men and a higher stroke rate as well. Uh, these were, were on univariate analysis, but on adjusted analysis, all of these associations held true. We look at descending thoracic endovascular aortic repair. Um, females were older in this study from the SVS Vascular Quality Initiative uh, project. Females also had larger indexed aortic diameters at the time of repair. They were more commonly symptomatic and more often underwent emergent or uh, urgent surgery. They had more blood loss during the procedures and needed more transfusions. They had longer ICU and hospital lengths of stay and had higher 30 and one year mortality rates with the long-term mortality uh, rate differences shown on the right with the men being in the blue and the uh, women in the red. Moving to the thoracobdominal aorta, this is, comes from a very nice review from Borghese and Mastracci of uh, several studies that have looked at differences uh, in both um, open repair of thoracobdominal aneurysms as shown in the uh, image on the left, as well as in endovascular repair. Uh, it must be said that in the open repair setting, there's substantial variation between the reports from different centers. However, there are some uh, reasonable uh, signals when you look at all of these collectively. Women tended to have more major adverse events, uh, more commonly had non-home discharge, and had higher rates of early uh, uh, and late mortality. In the endovascular repair of thoracobdominal aneurysms, uh, females had more bleeding and more ischemic complications, including uh, paraplegia, a lower technical success rate and more reinterventions and had a higher early mortality rates. So to summarize, there are uh, very important differences between uh, males and females in terms of the epidemiology and clinical presentation of thoracic aortic aneurysms and dissections that we're going to hear a lot more about the difference in fundamental aortic wall biology between uh, females and males, and then outcomes after surgical treatment tend to be uh, substantially less favorable in female patients. Um, so uh, to close with a few imperatives going forward, and this is really taken from the call to action that uh, Drs. Chung and colleagues laid out in their review in JTCVS, it's very important to ensure that there is an evaluation of sex-specific findings in all research in the field. And this includes ensuring that um, there's adequate representation of women in um, prospective clinical studies. There needs to be continued investigation of the mechanisms underlying sex-based differences in aortic aneurysms and dissection. And there's a need to develop and implement novel sex-specific guidelines for a risk assessment, for prevention, diagnosis, surveillance, and treatment strategies. Uh, I'll close with, again, uh, just a quick shout out to these uh, really terrific reviews uh, in case people would like to read further. I thank you all for joining the webinar, and I, I certainly look forward to um, uh, Dr. Cassis and Dr. Sipp's presentations and the questions after. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lemaire, for such a great overview. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Lisa A. Cassis received a BS in pharmacy. University, followed by a PhD in pharmacology from the West Virginia University School of Medicine. Dr. Cassis has been faculty at the University of Kentucky since 1988, where she currently serves as vice president for research. Her focus has been on sexual dimorphism of angiotensin II induced aneurysms, studying both sex hormones and sex chromosome complement, with the goal of identifying therapies that are optimized according to sex. Dr. Cassis, you have the floor. Thank you, Lauren. Let me see if I can get my slides up here and make, make them viewable. Good to go? You are good to go. 
All right. So it's really a pleasure to uh, follow Dr. Lemaire, who I uh, have had the great pleasure of working with for the past few years, and to be a part of this GenTech Alliance. Uh, I, I'm privileged and honored to be with you today. And my task is to try to get to the experimental level uh, to try to dissect out some of the mechanisms of sex-based differences in aortopathies, uh, which we call aneurysms. So all of the data I'll share with you today uh, is, is from the angiotensin II model of aortopathy development, which was uh, found and developed at the University of Kentucky in collaboration uh, with my colleague, Alan Dockerty, who is the director of the Cardiovascular Research Center there. In 1999 and 2000, quite some time ago, uh, Alan and I found that if you infuse the peptide angiotensin II, in this case into hypercholesteremic mouse models, uh, you can see that the uh, aorta goes from this very translucent normal structure to a large kind of aneurysmal pathology, in this case, in the suprarenal aorta. In follow-up studies in Allen's laboratory, uh, he started infusing angiotensin into mice uh, that are actually C57 black six on standard diet. And he found that if he infused angiotensin for up to one month, and he measured the ascending aortic diameter and luminal area of the ascending aorta, that it was indeed increased by angiotensin II. So angiotensin has the ability to cause aortopathy formation in distinct parts of uh, along the length of the aorta. So for today's presentation, I'm gonna show you a few different ways of quantifying these pathologies just to orient you. On the left, uh, we do use ultrasound to measure the ascending aortic lumen diameter as an index of dilation. We also, at the study endpoint, take the aorta out, clean it, open it up, and measure the uh, area of the aortic arch as an index of aortopathy. And also at study endpoint on cleaned aortas, we measure the external diameter in the distal thoracic part of the aortic aorta as an index of aortopathy formation. And I'm going to be studying mice. And uh, to my knowledge, I don't know how mice express gender. So I'm going to be just studying the biologic sex determinants. Uh, of sex hormones. And in my talk, I'll focus on male sex hormones, as well as sex chromosome genotype, uh, meaning XX in females and XY in males. So these are studies now from age-matched male and female mice. On the left, we have C57 black six mice that are fed a standard diet. These mice, as they're infused with angiotensin II, you can see at the top, the males have larger lumen diameters, which you've heard from Scott in some of the review of the literature. And at the study endpoint, they have larger external diameters of the descending thoracic aorta. On the right, if we take this now into a genetically manipulated mouse model, the LDL receptor knockout mouse fed a Western diet this pathology persists from angiotensin infusion in this model where the aortic arch area is higher or increased in the male compared to the female. So we set about to try to understand mechanisms of these sex differences. And based on previous work in our laboratory around the uh, abdominal aortic aneurysms, we focused on male androgen. So how do we get at male androgen? Well, it's not a therapy anyone wants to undergo, but we castrate the males. Uh, here abbreviated as gonadectomy. So in this case, we took uh, male mice, we either sham operated or castrated them to remove both testes. We waited two weeks to clear the endogenous male sex hormone and let the mice recover. And then we infused them with angiotensin II. And you can see if we take away their testes and their source of male testosterone, there is a marked reduction in thoracic aortopathy incidence. And so these are the percentage of mice that develop a pathology from the angiotensin infusion. In the middle, these are cross sections of the thoracic aorta from the sham operated or castrated mice. You can see in the sham operated mice, the aortic wall is much thicker and larger. And the box shows a blow up of that aortic wall. 
uh, where we see the pronounced thickening actually in the adventitia of the aorta or the outer part of the aortic wall. If we castrate the male mouse, all of that aortic thickening pretty much goes away when we quantify it here on the right. So testosterone, at least in this model, is a markedly significant promoter of the pathology. However, um, we didn't stop there. Uh, we have been studying in our laboratory for quite some years now, uh, another important biologic determinant of sex, and that is namely our sex chromosome genotype where females are XX and males are XY. We study this because the X chromosome is gene rich and has as much as 5% of the human genome. So it's a significant contributor to the human genome and our genetics. By comparison, while the Y chromosome is gene poor, there are portions of the Y chromosome that have been linked to cardiovascular diseases. And most importantly for us, uh, we looked in the literature around Turner syndrome a Turner syndrome is a condition of monosomy X in females. So they only have one X rather than two X chromosomes. And those females have a pronounced increased risk of aortic or thoracic dilation and dissection. So there seem to be some indications in humans that sex chromosome genotype may play a role. So is there a role for sex chromosomes and how do you study that or how do we study that? These studies from here on out were performed by Yasir Al-Siraj, who is an assistant professor at the University of Kentucky. So we set about uh, to study this using a mouse model that can actually help you dissect out the relative role of sex hormones via castration versus sex chromosomes. So the model is a male mouse that has a mutation in the SRY gene. The SRY gene is responsible for the production of testes in males, and SRY is on the Y chromosome. In this mouse, SRY was inserted onto autosomes. So now we've separated out the ability to produce testes from the presence of SRY with the presence of the Y chromosome. When this male mouse is uh, crossed to a female, normal XX mouse, we get what are called four core genotypes, namely XX, normal females, and now XY females, both with ovaries, or XY normal males, or XX males, both with testes. And all of these studies were performed on an LDL receptor knockout background fed a Western diet. So what happens when we infuse the four core genotype mice with angiotensin II to initiate the aortopathy formation? What you can see is if they are XY, whether they are females with ovaries or males with testosterone, they have a high incidence of pathology in the distal thoracic aorta. It is not a modest pathology. It is a very severe pathology. You can see the comparison of aortas from XX normal females to the XY females, quite interesting. Now, what we also found from this model, we also developed those males and the males are either normal XY or they are males with two X chromosomes, but they do have testes and make testosterone. And one thing that we noted in these studies is if they were XY, the pathology from angiotensin infusion was very diffuse along the entire length of the aorta. What was fascinating to us is if we made an XX male and where they had testosterone, which will promote this disease, the aneurysms or aortopathies were very focal and restricted to the suprarenal part of the aorta, almost like we took an XX aorta from a female and put it into the context of a male with testosterone. Something fascinating, which we still don't understand, why does sex chromosome genotype contribute to where the aneurysms form? But I'd like to pivot in the last uh, bits of my presentation to try to go further now and say, well, what is it? 
Is it two female X chromosomes that are protecting against aortopathies in the ascending and distal thoracic aorta? Or is it the presence of the Y chromosome that is promoting these pathologies? To answer this question, we used another sex chromosome model. It's called the XY star model. This is a mouse that ha has a Y chromosome with an aberrant pseudosomal autosomal region or PAR, and that recombines variably with the X PAR during meiosis. So when this male is crossed to a normal female, we have females that are either XX, which is normal, or we have females that only have one X chromosome analogous to females with Turner syndrome. For the sake of time today, I'm only gonna show you data on the female mice from this model. So we took these XX and XO females now, and we infused them with our angiotensin II for one month. And for comparison, we included a group of XY males which we know are susceptible to these pathologies from angiotensin infusion. What you can see is in the distal thoracic and even in the abdominal aorta, if they are XO, they start to develop the pathology at a similar incidence or prevalence as an intact male mice. And what we put at the bottom is to simplify for you by looking at the aortas. If they're XX, they're protected. If they're XO, they become highly susceptible to diffuse pathologies equivalent almost to an X1 male. Now, more recently, we've been trying to understand the mechanisms of these sex chromosome influences. And in this particular case, we're focusing on genes that escape X inactivation. So X inactivation is a biologic process where one of the X alleles is silenced in females so that there are not gene dosage effects in the majority of our genes on the X chromosome. But some genes escape that X inactivation. In other words, they're not X inactivated. And those genes might have gene dosage effects with higher expression levels in XX than XO mice. We have listed here a series of genes that are known to escape X inactivation and in this experiment, we took the thoracic aortas from our XX and XO females, and we did RNA-seq on those aortas. And these aortas were not infused with angiotensin II. So these are baseline differences. We looked at a variety of these genes in our RNA-seq data, and two genes became apparent in having higher or different expression levels between XX and XO mice. Those genes are KDM5C and KDM6A. To the right, we have RT-PCR analysis of the thoracic aorta to validate and confirm these differences, where you can see that these two genes, KDM5C and 6A, have at least twofold higher expression in XX than XO aortas, indicating gene dosage effects. Now, what are these genes? Uh, these two particular genes uh, are proteins that are lysine-specific histone demethylases. Uh, what they do is they remodel chromatin and they are epigenetic modifiers. So they can have downstream effects on a variety of genes. Now, Dr. Siraj in his own independent program has been pursuing this further where he has now obtained KDM5C heterozygous knockout females. So they would be analogous almost to our XO females because they would not have two copies, but one copy of the KDM5C gene. When he looked at these mice in pilot studies, these are females, even without angiotensin infusion, they had dilated ascending aortic lumen diameters. So they already had some evidence of uh, pathology. And when he infused them with angiotensin II, the KDM5C heterozygote mice had uh, larger lumen diameters in the ascending aorta. And at the study endpoint, they had a more uh, greater size of the external diameter of their ascending aorta. Last but not least, and this is data in collaboration with Dr. LaMare, Dr. Shin and Lee, 
uh, at the Baylor College of Medicine. Uh, we had the wonderful opportunity of working with these colleagues who uh, took human now tissues. So these are human tissues from female controls or male controls. These are ascending aortic pieces. And then he also they also had the capability of getting uh, aneurysmal, ascending aortic aneurysmal aortas from females or males. They did single cell genomics to look at gene expression patterns in the various cells in those aortic samples. And in this case, uh, we were interested in smooth muscle cells, understanding that smooth muscle cells, of course, are highly intimately involved in both the formation and in the progressive uh, pathology of ascending aortic aneurysms. To blow this up for you, in their analysis, uh, the size of the dot is analogous to the expression level. The first point to make is the females have higher expression of KDM5C in smooth muscle cells compared to the male control uh, smooth muscle cells from these aortic samples. And another uh, thing of interest to provide human relevance to our studies potentially is the female disease tissue has lower levels of expression of KDM5C analogous to our XO or KDM5C heterozygous mice. So in summary, using the angiotensin model of aortopathy development, males have more thoracic aortopathy than females. Male sex hormones are certainly strong promoters of that pathology, but the pathologies are also affected by sex chromosome genotype, where an XY sex chromosome genotype promotes more diffuse aortopathies and two X chromosomes can protect females from these aortopathies. It's possible that genes on the X chromosome that escape the X inactivation process and have gene dosage effects like KDM5C, which is an epigenetic modifier, may contribute to the sex differences in thoracic aortopathies and our future research in Dr. Al Siraj's program is to look at downstream targets of KDM5C. And like Dr. Lemaire uh, mentioned, with the goal of, of elucidating sex specific therapeutics. I thank all of my colleagues at the University of Kentucky uh, and the Doherty and Cassis Labs, and of course, my Baylor colleagues and the funding. So thank you very much uh, for having me be part of this, the webinar, and I'm happy to answer questions in the chat. That was wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Cassis. Okay, I'd now like to introduce our next speaker. Patrick Sips obtained his PhD from Ghent University in Belgium. In 2007, he moved to the United States where he did his postdoctoral training at Massachusetts General Hospital and the Brigham and Women's Hospital, where he was trained in using both mice and zebrafish for cardiovascular disease modeling. In 2017, Dr. Sips returned to Ghent University where he is now an assistant professor at the Department for Biomolecular Medicine. He is currently studying animal models to explore the mechanisms leading to thoracic aortic disease and to find potential new treatments. Dr. Sips. All right, thank you very much, Lauren, for this nice introduction. And uh, thank you, of course, to the uh, Alliance for inviting me to speak today. And it'll be a, a big uh, task for me to follow these beautiful presentations by Dr. Lambert and Dr. Cassis, but I'll try my best. So in my talk today, I'll try to first give you a brief overview on uh, some of the clinical work that has been done on sexual dimorphism in Marfan syndrome, uh, including some work that has been done in our group in Ghent. Uh, and the second part of my talk will be more focused on the studies that have been uh, done in different mouse models in relation to the sex differences observed in Marfan syndrome. So um, as you heard from the previous talk, especially, I think um, it's very clear there's uh, sex differences, uh, not only in thoracic aortic disease, but more generally in disease as well. Um, and we tend to approach this mostly from the biological perspective, of course, where we focus on sex chromosomes and the uh, influence of sex hormones on pathophysiology. But we have to keep in mind that, especially looking at uh, patient data, there's also certain gender constructs imposed by society, which can have an, can have an effect on uh, lifestyle, nutrition, or exercise, for instance. And these can have a real impact on the, the patient lives. Uh, they can have an impact, of course, on the time to diagnosis, for instance, or decision-making for treatments. 
this is something I think we should always keep in mind when looking at human data, but unfortunately, of course, it's something we cannot really capture yet in our mass models. But um, I'd like to start off with um, an, an overview based on the GenTech data that's, that has been published a number of years ago. Um, the GenTech data looked at uh, almost 800 Marfan syndrome patients and looked at the, um, uh, yeah, the effects, the different effects in male and female patients. And it was quite clear from these data that men in, in general have a larger aortic diameter um, than, than uh, female uh, Marfan syndrome patients. While on the other hand, it looks like uh, the female Marfan syndrome patients have higher rates of mitral valve prolapse. So likely related to this increased aortic root dilatation in, in, in men, they tend to have uh, earlier surgery and probably more prophylactic surgery. So in general, there's a higher rate of, of surgery in, in male patients. And although it's not statistically significant, there also tends to be um, a, a trend towards more aortic dissection in male Marfan syndrome patients. Nevertheless, when you look at the data pulled apart by, by age groups, you can see that um, specifically for the type A dissections, um, there's a group of uh, fairly young women between the age of 30 and 34, which have a very high rate of type A dissections. So it's certainly a very important uh, complication of Marfan syndrome that uh, we cannot lose track of. So in our group, in our center, we have had a study also a number of years ago, um, following up um, male and female um, Marfan syndrome patients. Um, and when following up the aortic root diameters um, of these patients over their uh, time, over their lifetime, we found that um, there's certainly a significantly increase in the male aortic root diameter, which becomes significant only after the age of sexual matu maturity. So in uh, pediatric, pediatric cases, there does not appear to be a significant difference between uh, the two sexes. Um, I just mentioned previously from a GenTech data that it looks like there is no statistical significant difference in the aortic, aortic dissection rates between uh, men and women. Um, nevertheless, um, in the cohorts, both from our center as well as from our colleagues in France, um, there seems to be a very small tendency towards uh, a more female contribution. So more female patients seem to um, uh, undergo either type A or type B dissection in both our centers. Of course, these numbers are too small to make any statistical um, um, assumptions from this. But it's interesting to, to keep this in mind, and it's certainly, as, as Dr. Lemaire already highlighted, aortic dissection is certainly a problem, a, a, a big problem in female patients as well. And this probably makes uh, more sense in light of um, the pregnancy-related risk. So it was also very clear from the GenTag data, where they had uh, data from 94 ever-pregnant ever pregnant, uh, Marfan syndrome patients. Um, that this period is associated with a very high risk for, for aortic complications. Uh, more than 10% of these uh, Marfan syndrome uh, female patients uh, had an aortic complication in the, the peripartum periods, which is defined as a time during pregnancy and including three months after uh, in the postpartum periods. Um, and as I as shown here on the slide, six of the eight dissections that occurred in these patients occurred in the postpartum periods. When you then compare the rates of aortic dissection in these uh, in this pregnant and postpartum periods, uh, there's approximately a ninefold higher risk compared to the non-pregnant uh, periods. This data has been confirmed by other cohorts as well. There was a recent publication from Weill Cornell where they also uh, confirmed that the dissection rates were approximately five times higher during the pregnancy period in comparison to women who were not pregnant. Um, the type A dissections that occurred were only in women who were unaware of diagnosis, so they likely had already a larger aorta, uh, aortic diameter, which is undetected before, uh, before pregnancy. Um, but nevertheless, the type B dissections also occurred in known Marfan syndrome patients, um, and they occurred at smaller aortic diameters, so they were much harder to predict. And this is also true, of course, unfortunately, also for non-pregnant Marfan syndrome patients. Um, again, in our center, we also have some um, uh, uh, expertise uh, or some, some work on this from the past. 
um, uh, our physicians followed up a number of um, non-pregnant women and pregnant women uh, with the diagnosis of Marfan syndrome and compared this with male patients. And, and it was clear when looking at aortic root growths that this was uh, significantly increased in uh, only in um, the pregnant women uh, compared to non-pregnant women. And the aortic root growth was mostly increased in the time between the baseline and uh, the time at pregnancy. Again, confirming that this is a very uh, critical period and that needs to be monitored closely if a patient has a, a diagnosis of Marfan syndrome and it tends to get pregnant. So with this as a general introduction, uh, let's say on the, the more clinical um, aspects of gender or sex differences in, in, in Marfan syndrome, uh, I'd like to go to a second part of my talk, which focuses on the use of mouse models to try and understand the differences that are observed in patients. So there's a number of mouse models that have been studied. Um, we have worked um, a number of years ago and still are working on this mouse model, the GT8 model, which has been generated by the group of uh, Lin Sakai in Portland. Um, this mouse model consists of uh, a GT8, trun uh, a truncated allele, um, which um, has a, the, the C-terminal part of fibrillin replaced by a GFP marker. These mice are considered to be a mild model of Marfan syndrome, um, and they show progressive aortic dilation, but they do not spontaneously progress through uh, aortic dissection or rupture. In a study we published a number of years ago, um, it was shown that the uh, aortic dilation was uh, significantly larger in the male mutant mice compared to the female mutant mice. And then if we even compared the females that were never pregnant um, compared to those that were allowed to breed and had uh, multiple litters, we found that the mice that had been pregnant um, had a significantly increased uh, aortic diameter compared to those who had not been pregnant. And even to the, um, to the extent that they were very comparable to the male mutants. So this increase in uh, the uh, aortic diameter also correlated with the amount of elastin damage that was observed in the aortic roots. So you can see here uh, a staining for elastic lamellae. Um, and if you quantify this in the different groups, uh, you will notice that in every um, sex, there was a significant increase um, with uh, the mutant genotype versus the control. However, when we um, more closely looked at the major breaks, and major breaks are defined as um, breaks in at least three consecutive elastic lamellae, as you can see here in this part uh, of a slide, or the same thing here then you can see that the uh, number of major breaks are relatively low in um, the female GT8 mice, but was much higher in the male mutants. And also almost at the same level was uh, much increased in the, the ever pregnant uh, GT8 mutant mice. So echoing a bit the, the data we see in the clinic. To try to understand the mechanisms behind this, uh, these uh, sex differences, um, uh, a small ex in vitro experiment was done um, where uh, human aortic smooth muscle cells were cultured and were stimulated with uh, estrogen. And uh, it was found that uh, 24 hour stimulation with estrogen led to increased fibrillin 1 production. So providing one possible mechanism for the potentially protective effects of, of uh, this sex hormone. Um, we also try to follow up a bit on this aspect um, based on this in vitro data. We went to an in vivo, in vivo study as well. Um, we performed ovarectomy and orchidectomy and looked uh, in um, the GT8 mouse model. Um, and this is still a preliminary study, so the data are not complete, but as, as you see, the numbers are relatively low. But it looks like from these data um, that the males who underwent orchidectomy, so they were castrated effectively, that they did have a better aortic phenotype than the ones who were not castrated. So the number of major breaks were significantly lower. Uh, well, not statistically yet, but they were uh, tended to be lower in the orchidectomized mice. The female uh, mice on, that underwent uh, ovarectomy um, did not seem to have a, a much different response from the control females, but there seemed to be also a tendency towards a bit more damage, although this was certainly not significant. Um, other groups uh, have also studied a different model. It's a very common model for Marfan syndrome, uh, probably known to most of you, which is a C1041G, which is a, a model containing uh, a missense mutation, which leads to a cysteine substitution. 
this is a model um, based on a, a variant known in patients uh, that suffer from classical Marfan syndrome. It's a bit more severe than the GT8 model. Um, they also uh, have significant aortic dilation, but um, also they do not uh, progress to a spontaneous dissection and rupture. Um, the group in Barcelona has found that uh, aortic elastin damage, for instance, was higher, again, in the male mutants compared to the female mutants. Um, and this is also uh, correlating with the um, diameter measured in the proximal aortic uh, region, where it was seen that uh, in the males, this progressively increases in the male mutants, but the female mutants um, uh, were certainly much, had a much smaller aortic, root, uh, aortic um, diameter. Um, there was an interesting study then um, uh, from the group of Tashima. Um, this is the group from Stanford, um, where they, again, they confirmed that the aortic root growth was uh, significantly increased in the mutant male mice compared to the females, and again, correlating with elastin damage. But then they uh, treated these mice with uh, flutamide, which is a, an antagonist for the androgen receptor. Um, they treated these mice uh, at this period from 6 to 16 weeks. And they found that this significantly ameliorated the aortic phenotype. So they had a decreased aortic root growth and also decreased elastin breaks. So again, this points to a potential detrimental role of testosterone in aortic disease associated with uh, Marfan syndrome. Um, the group from um, Sarah Parker from the UCLA approached it from the other perspective, and they uh, also um, looked at the same model, the C1041G. Uh, again, looking at aortic root growth, and instead of looking at uh, blocking testosterone, they actually treated uh, the mice with uh, estrogen. So they gave them a four-week treatment of estrogen, and then looked at aortic root growth. And there, they could see that this treatment uh, reduced um, the aortic root growth in the females. Um, and then they also subjected this mouse model to angiotensin II infusion to induce dissection and rupture. As you can see, the controls uh, at five months of age, age they all um, were affected by dissection and more than half of them actually ruptured and died. But the mice that were pre-treated uh, with estrogen, um, they um, had significantly less rupture and, and higher survival than the control mice. So these are male mice treated with estrogen. Um, a potential mechanism is highlighted in this figure. Uh, one of the findings of the study was that the inflammatory foci that are present in uh, male mice, in the aortic root in male mice, as uh, highlighted by the CD45 stain here, were significantly reduced when treating the mice with, uh, with estrogen. Um, so this could be another potential mechanism of how estrogen can maybe protect. So uh, again, adding to all the data that uh, suggests that estrogen really protects against aortic disease. Uh, the final model I'd like to talk about is the MGR mouse model, which is a much more severe model of uh, Marfan syndrome. It's a hypomorphic model, which is caused by retention of uh, an intronic neomycin cassette. And these mice have about 20% left of normal fibrillin-1 expression. So these mice do spontaneously dissect and uh, have aortic rupture. And most of these mice will die by the age of four to five months. Um, so the group from the uh, University of Kentucky has, uh, again, confirmed that there was a, a sex difference where the males had a, a significantly larger aortic uh, diameter than the females. And interestingly, um, they very recently also um, posted a bioarchive uh, manuscript where, uh, and I want to draw your attention here to the red line, these are all male mice where you can see um, the survival um, of these mice um, decreasing with age due to the aortic rupture occurring. So they, most of them are dead by four months. However, um, in, in the paper, they mentioned that uh, the female mice had a much higher survival than the males. And they were basically similar to wild types. So they had a very good survival and this was significantly uh, very significant. Um, so this is quite interesting because we had a similar study ongoing, uh, a, a bit of a smaller study um, where we only followed up the mice up to two months of age. Uh, the same mouse model, it's the same MGR model. And in our hands, uh, we did not observe this, um, this difference in survival, however. So we observed at two months, approximately 20% mortality, both in the males and the females. Um, we did see a small difference. Uh, it was statistically significant, but it's a small difference in the uh, amount of elastic fiber damage in the aortic roots. So where, again, the males had uh, more damage than the females. Um, 
that's yeah. So that uh, is the only difference that we found. But the survival is certainly the same. Um, and this actually brings me to the last study I want to highlight, which could maybe explain some of the differences that are seen between different centers, because there was a study very recently from the group uh, at McGill University, where they looked at the effects of high fat, di high fat diets in male and female MGR mice. Um, interestingly, in the control diet mice, they did not see a, a sex difference between male and female mutants, but when they fed the females with high fat diets, they actually saw an improvement improvements in the um, diameter of these mice. Also, the elastic fiber degradation was significantly decreased in the female mice that were fed uh, high fat diets. Um, this was uh, correlating with uh, decreases of levels of MMB12 and the collagens 1A1 and 1A3. So what this study shows is that the diet can also affect sexual dimorphism, um, which may potentially explain why we see a different uh, um, sexual dimorphism effects between different centers using the same mouse models. Uh, a potential explanation for this effect could be that high fat, high fat diet uh, increases estrogen levels in the female mice, um, because perhaps um, the increased adipose tissue would lead to more aromatase uh, activity and aromatase effectively converts testosterone into estrogen. And this could then lead to higher levels of estrogen and protection against aortic disease in these mice. So taken uh, all together uh, from the human studies, I think it is quite clear that there's a, a very strong difference between men and women with Marfan syndrome, where men have a much uh, increased aortic diameter and more aortic events, uh, more aortic events than female patients. Um, although there's no difference in the overall dissection rate between men and women with Marfan syndrome, um, clearly during pregnancy, there is certainly a much higher risk for uh, aortic events, including uh, increased aortic root growth and dissection. Um, in mouse models, we could confirm sexual dimorphism in pretty much every mouse model that has, been, that has been studied so far. Although sometimes, as I just mentioned, these effects are not always reproducible. This could be perhaps due to the genetic, genetic background or environment, and as I just mentioned, maybe the diet plays a role. Um, the data so far seem to indicate that estrogen protects against aortic disease, while on the other hand, testosterone may have a, a more aggravating effect. So in the future, and I think my conclusions uh, are pretty much exactly the same as what Dr. Lulmer said in his first presentation. So we need to include both sexes in all studies on Marfan syndrome and uh, I guess as well in all other thoracic diseases. We need to have more studies on the mechanisms uh, that are responsible for this sexual dimorphism. And for clinical uh, purposes, it's certainly important to develop sex-based algorithms for risk certification, monitoring and treatment of these patients. Uh, and I'd just like to take a Thank, of course, all the investigators from our group um, involved in this work, as well as Lin Sakai, of course. And I'd like to thank you again for your attention, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that may have come up. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dr. Sips. I'd like to thank our speakers, Dr. Scott Lemaire, Lisa Cassis, and Patrick Sips for their excellent presentations on a topic of such great importance in the study and treatment of thoracic aortic disease. Um, our audience members have uh, already submitted some questions. If you have questions but haven't yet done so, please get those into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, our first question for our speakers, uh, are there sex differences in the effectiveness of treatments for individuals with Marfan syndrome? Anyone, yeah. anyone is welcome to jump in. I don't know if I can actually give a straight answer to that. Uh, certainly from mouse data, I'm not aware of any studies yet, but I could be wrong. Uh, and again, also from the clinical side, I think I'll have to look to Dr. Lemaire or Dr. Cassis uh, to see if they have any insights, but I am not really aware of any studies focusing on this particularly, but it's a very important question for sure. Yeah, I... I um... I really I concur with Dr. Sips. Um, I think it's it's not well studied. So questions like, uh, for example, is um, is the effectiveness of losartan or beta blockers on aortic progression um, different in in men and and women? I don't I don't think there's strong data uh, to show. Um, I think in terms of effectiveness of surgical treatments, um, at least in, in terms of prevention of um, um, 
for example, in root surgery, valve sparing root surgery, we don't see differences in the durability of those types of repairs in uh, male versus female patients. Um, I think there are, are, you know, because it's a younger patient population, some of the differences we saw that were related to co potentially related to comorbidities in women in the sporadic, uh, in the treatment of sporadic disease with either arch repair or um, thoracic abdominal repair um, might be somewhat alleviated in the younger patient population that 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 those with genetically triggered forms of aortic disease have. Yeah. So I, I think it's really understudied and a lot of room for um, expanding knowledge in this area. I guess I'll add my two cents. Um, you know, um, it's hard to do experimentally, probably, uh, honestly. Certainly in the angiotensin model, that is very hard to do because female mice don't get the aneurysm. So you can't really... Uh, test the effect of an intervention uh, easily in these experimental models. But I think it's a great question. I don't know if it lends itself towards a more precision medicine kind of approaches uh, in the treatment of aortopathies between the sexes. Uh, certainly that's what we're trying to do is find these targets of sex chromosome epigenetic modifiers that might have more effectiveness in one sex versus the other. But I, I don't think we know. I think we've all kind of agreed upon that one. Thank you for that, all of our speakers. Uh, next question, what is the risk of thoracic aortic aneurysm in people undergoing gender affirming surgery? As healthcare professionals, how do we best treat individuals receiving such care? Uh, I'm happy to start with that. It, it's actually fairly, you know, particularly the first question is an easy one to answer and that there's there are no data, right, in um, um, the effects of gender affirming surgery on the on the aorta. Um, and so, and I think, it, you know, because that's a relatively new um, offering to patients, um, the time it will take to get enough numbers of patients to really evaluate that, uh, that's something that's going to be in the distant future, I, sus I suspect. I think my more concerning to me than um, gender affirming surgery would be the hormonal treatments for uh, transgender patients and what impacts that may have on the uh, aortic wall and progression of disease. And I, I think, you know, some of the, the uh, data you've seen um, today on the effects of um, uh, hormones on the aortic wall really raise some concern about what that may be. It, it is, they, there are already um, associations between hormonal uh, treatment um, and other cardiovascular conditions. Uh, I just we, we just don't know in terms of what that will pretend for the auric wall yet. I, I could maybe add to experimentally. Um, I think Dr. Sips showed that giving estrogen to males uh, did have some influences in the Marfan's models. We have given dihydrotestosterone to females. Um, uh, we, uh, you know, certainly have no idea if the hormone levels that we're giving and that are achieved are similar to what would be in the transgender population. But uh, at least experimentally, dihydrotestosterone exposure to females in the angiotensin model makes them highly susceptible to uh, both the very diffuse uh, aortopathies. Thank you. Yeah. I can only agree on any data. I think uh, just the only thing I want to add is that the, the flutamide data that were also, of course, in the mouse model, so I don't know how it translates to the humans, of course, but uh, it, it seemed like inhibiting testosterone uh, activity, at least, uh, also had a positive effect on, on aortic disease. So um, that is certainly one aspect. And indeed, we have to be mindful or careful of, of giving people more as uh, more testosterone because that seems to potentially have some detrimental effects but again will need to be confirmed in in human data for sure thank you our next question is for dr sips the cd45 plus region in the taas you showed uh was that coming from inflammatory cells or were smcs expressing cd45 
Yeah, so um, of course it's not our study, it's from the, the group of uh, Sarah Parker from UCLA, but from uh, what I would think and also based on our own experience, I would say that these are immune cells that are coming in. Um, it's um, a staining that was quite clear in the adventitial side. And it's something that we have observed and not only our group, other groups as well, as well have observed that um, regions of aortic damage in, in mouse models uh, seem to also um, concur with regions where we see recruitment of uh, inflammatory cells. So it is likely that these are inflammatory cells come in much more likely than it actually is smooth muscle cells that have a CD45 expression. Thank you. Uh, next question, why don't mouse models reproduce the findings from Dr. Lemire's presentation about female patients having more severe aneurysms with lower survival? Could it be explained by clinical bias? Well, one comment I can give on this already is that, that my presentation focused mostly on, on the Marfan syndrome models. And of course, that's only one aspect. Um, I think the, the data that Dr. Lemire uh, was alluding to is from all thoracic aortic diseases and, and including many more uh yeah conditions and uh, apart from Marfan syndrome so that is possibly one part of the answer um yeah that's all i can say I, from, from my side. I mean in, in the inch two model you know i actually don't think we disagree to to that great of an extent so so where we see the difference in that model is in the formation or the susceptibility between males and females but if a female mouse if we can trick her into getting an aneurysm honestly from angiotensin uh, by either making her XY or exposing her to testosterone. Honestly, we see something similar. The pathology is much more severe in females uh, and they rupture uh, quite a bit. Uh, it's, it's quite pronounced. So I don't know that they're all that discordant, but I guess it depends on the models. Yeah, I'll, I'll happy just to weigh in. I, I think the impact on clinical and healthcare delivery factors cannot be uh, overstated, right? And and so you know when I when I use the the phrase that disease is more severe in female patients, it's because they're they're presenting later, their diagnosis is being made later. It's not necessarily a fundamental difference. There are fundamental differences in the aortic wall biology, but those don't necessarily um, explain the differences in outcomes and, and, and a variety of things. And I think the fact that they are, their uh, presentations are a bit different and that uh, for a patient coming into an emergency room, if they're um, a woman and they're not having typical symptoms, their pain may be more likely attributed to other things that then start to get investigated. And so their diagnosis is delayed. Um, if you delay them going for a definitive surgical repair, that you're likely to have, um, you know, more in higher incidence of tamponade and other things are going to make outcomes of surgery worse. So I, I really think that the a lot of it is the clinical factors, um, those that we can measure and those that we don't even measure that that play a major role in in the differences in severity at the time of presentation. Great, thank you. Uh, do we have data for sex difference in other organs in Marfan syndrome patients or animal models? Uh, I can start just uh, the uh, paper by Mary Roman that Dr. Sips um, uh, presented um, really looked at different clinical features across the GenTech cohort. We focused on the, um, the aortic disease uh, with the cardiovascular disease, the mitral valve prolapse, aortic disease, but um, you know, in that paper, she she also you know looked at other um, you know common you know features in Marfan syndrome and found things like differences in arachnidactyly with a, a higher um, incidence in females, uh, differences in scoliosis again a higher incidence in females. Um, we already talked about the mitral valve uh, issue. Um, the eye findings were very similar in uh, males and females, as were uh, pectus um, pectus changes. Um, so I, I refer you to that paper for it. It's a, she did a really great job of sort of looking at the broad phenotypic spectrum in, in comparison uh, between the two sexes. Thank you. 
Our last question, uh, are there any comparisons of outcomes of males versus females in different ethnic backgrounds? Uh, I'm not aware of any that have um, that have looked at both the uh, gender and racial differences. Um, so I, I can't answer beyond that. I'm not aware of anything that has been helpful in that area. Okay, thank you. Um, not to put you on the spot, but Dr. Lemaire, Dr. Cassis, and Dr. Sips, if, if you have uh, questions or comments for your fellow, fellow speakers or any parting words, um, I, I welcome those now. And if, if not, that's okay too. Okay. Thank you again for your talks today. Uh, very much appreciated uh, on such an important topic. Uh, let me share my screen again for just a moment as we wrap things up. Um, many thanks to those of you in our audience who participated today and also to our wonderful speakers. If you are not yet familiar with the GenTech Alliance, please check out our new website at gentechalliance.org and join our email list. Um, there are a lot of great resources on the new site, including recordings of past GenTech webinars, which is where this webinar will, will live in a, about a week or so. So please be sure to check that out. And finally, uh, the GenTech website is also where you can register for our next webinar on March 7th, titled Molecular and Cellular Dynamics in Aortic Diseases, New Insights from Single-Cell Transcriptomic Studies. I will also be sending an email out to our community later today with more info about that webinar. So thank you so much for joining us today. Have a wonderful afternoon, evening, morning, whatever it may be. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.